Looks like the boss is ready, so uh, call the meeting to order. And we have no one to excuse from the meeting. And so I do, I, just in case some of you didn't meet Carter, is someone new here, uh, working with Sandra, the poor fellow, for the summer. <laughs> Actually, she'll, she'll will uh, amaze and uh, just amaze you. I, I just know it, Carter. <laughs> she already <laughs> has. <laughs> Oh, we like you, <laughs> and I think she probably does too. <laughs> so welcome to our uh, community, and uh, it's always nice to have someone new at our table. Thanks for having me. You bet. Um, all right, adoption of the minutes from April 25th. Any concerns, Brian? Um. You'll Do move, I have a concern? You have a question, okay. I have a question. In regards to the 7-1, the North Air Head Gates Area Redevelopment Plan, there was a comment made by one of our people that are our guests at the very end about, um, and he wanted it recorded in the minutes, and it's not in there. And it had to do with his, the landowner. His what? The landowner. His the landowner. Do you remember that? And the lawyer involved? Yes. I, I'm just curious whether it's appropriate. I mean, he wanted it recorded. And it's, of course, it's on YouTube, so it, and technically it is. But I'm just, it's not in the minutes. So I'm curious how we handle that. I have no idea. I can't hear you, Wayne. Um, I guess uh, Wayne's comment was whether it was even whether it was an appropriate request or not, and I, I guess these are our minutes, but I, I, I don't know. Ariana. Um, yeah, he, his statement was he wanted a statement retracted from previous minutes. We couldn't find that exact statement in the previous minutes, so we kind of sanitized it to express concern with potential rent increases and representation of tenant interests on ARP matters. Any other comments on that? Good. Okay, thanks, Seriana. Kelly? I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. Kelly has moved the adoption of the minutes. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Uh, are there any post agenda items? I do have some uh, in camera lane. Yeah, likewise in camera land matters. Okay. Anything else, uh, Amory? Just uh, double checking if we're talking about the same one lane. We are. Okay. Okay. Can we have a notice or an adoption of the agenda, please? Clarence moves. All in favor? Opposed. Motion is carried. And so we will go to our eleven, our ten forty-five delegation. Cole, welcome. Thank you very much, Reed Douglas, and good morning, councillors. Good morning. So if, for those of you that have read my report already, um, it's kind of short and sweet this month, which is a good thing. Um, we haven't really delved into our spring maintenance 100% yet. Uh, we're just kind of getting that all organized, so this one will be short. Um, we'll start off with uh, some of your uh, asset maintenance we have a contractor, Cummins, that'll be coming out to do your annual maintenance on all the pump post standby generators so that they'll be arriving the day after the long weekend, so the week of May 21st. So that's an annual thing that we always do on your behalf. So they'll be coming out and doing all the gen sets. 
Um, for rural water, you can see that we had uh, one new hookup to the county new water project, and we had 13, give or take, because we've had a, a couple since I wrote this report last week. So 13 to 15 float valve issues in the past month. Um, Jeff uh, Tiffin and myself, we had a meeting about this yesterday, so there is a plan moving forward. Um, hopefully by the end of the year, well, it'll be fully implemented and we'll, we'll see some of these go away. So that's in the books, or in, in the works, sorry. Um, wastewater collection, uh, the Tilly lift station, I, I don't know if you recall, but three months ago or so, we were having a little bit of issues with the flow meter in the Tilly lift station, and I said we were kind of looking into it. So now that it's a little warmer than it was back then, we, uh, we got a crane and we, we pulled it out and we cleaned it uh, on the advice of the manufacturer. Uh, we reinstalled it and it seems to be working fine now. Um, so we're going to keep an eye on it to make sure that it's operating normally, but it seems to be fine now. So the Tilly lift station is functioning as, as it normally does. So that's a good thing. Um, and in-house at uh, Newell Regional Services, uh, we had Aquatech Diving. They're a specialty diving company that uh, clean out reservoirs. Um, so the main reservoirs at the water treatment plant, we're actually getting them vacuumed out for the best explanation of it. Um, so that is normal operations we do about every seven years. So we had them inspected about two years ago. There wasn't really cause for concern of anything down there. Had Everything structurally looked fine, and there was really no accumulation in there of alarming notes, so we just had a regular cleaning done, and they'll be finishing up this afternoon, actually. And that's the extent of my report, so if there's any questions. And are there any questions for Cole? Wayne. On these gen sets, uh, what do you, do your operators start them once a month to make sure they're running, and then you do the maintenance? like the oil change and everything at the end once a year? Yes. So we do, beginning of every month, we do a, a run test. So we write down all the, the info that we get on the, on the displays and give them a, a good run so that they, they don't sit there for extended periods of time. Um, we also do, on the ones that do have diesel, we check diesel levels and we don't keep them too full so we don't let the diesel get stale or anything like that. So. Um, we kind of keep an eye on that, and then, like you mentioned, once a year we get Cummins to come in, do the oil change, do the full expect inspection on the whole system. They actually do a, a several-hour load test on it to make sure everything's tip-top shape that you wouldn't see in a normal just run through once a month. Anything else? No. Thanks, Cole. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a good day. Mark, um, I was just trying to figure out the agenda here, and you may as well come to the table because sort of um, planning and development, sort of lumping a bunch of their stuff together in a while. Todd is later as well. And so item 10-2, Bow City Community Association, is that, is that your request? Ten two. I, I would address item that's, ten two. Okay. There's others that Mark can deal with. Okay, so save that for for you, Lane. Okay, so Mark, if you want to go to your report, I guess. Then. Okay, we'll go to the report, and just for council's information, I'll be in and out of here a lot today, paying attention to various matters if I can catch them. So, uh, over the past month. Um, April treated us fairly well with, uh, with stuff, and so we've got stockpile locations uh, full of gravel, main yard stockpile, stockpile, we continue to haul some aggregate in just to have on hand in the event of anything that we need. Um, trucking of aggregate soft spots, uh, yeah, last year was a good year for frost boils, not having very many, and this year's not treating us so great. So um, putting that additional weight on our roads and stuff like that is, is a stress. Uh, sometimes we do more damage than we do good. So um, waiting for some things to dry out in, in several areas before we can get to them, but trying to keep them flagged and, and identified for motorists and road users and, and dealing with 
significant hazards, um, but some of the some of the areas down south are already starting to heal up on their own, uh, saving us money rather than digging these things out and watching them move 50 feet down the road next year to go dig them out again and chase them. But uh, we're dealing with those. So the the guys of uh, truck drivers have kind of been put off on. Uh, other tasks with sweeping of pave aprons at intersections and, and bridges and stuff like that and helping uh, the maintenance crews in that area. So that's that's been good. And uh, there is the attached stockpile spreadsheet for council's information in that report. Uh, dozer and tract excavator were down in Scandia. So if uh, council remembers, there were two water reservoir ponds there that used to be used in the water treatment process of things. Uh, we haven't been in the water treatment business for a while now and uh, we've been slowly bringing clean fill into some of those ponds to fill them up. In Scandia's case, they have a raw water irrigation system, so they will be keeping the smallest pond, which is actually adjacent to Railway Avenue in Scandia. So the large pond we've been filling for the next, uh, for the past number of years, uh, the majority of that fill actually came from some of the EID uh, partnership drainage improvement stuff that we did in that area and we had just never gotten around to leveling off all of the piles that each truck dumped independently and stuff. So that got cleaned up and uh, working with ASB to get that seeded, which it has been seeded, and that way we can better maintain it for the community and keep the weeds and stuff down and have it a little bit nicer. Um, future uses of that site are kind of being tossed around in, in the office right now. Uh, potentially a small gravel stockpile or inventory pile of, of different materials and goods of stuff. Um, what, what else can we use it for? Maybe we've talked about tr heavy truck parking and stuff in Hamlets before and whatnot, so trying to keep some of those things on the list um, or whether there's something that comes forward in the future that maybe we need to look at. Is there an opportunity to sell the parcel or something as, as bare land or whatever? But those things are on our radar with, uh, with that, and that's what they've been working on um, to get those things cleaned up. Uh, highway plow trucks, of course, we had that one major winter event that saw about six inches of heavy slush, slush deposited on our roads on a Sunday of all days for it to happen. Uh, so our guys were out moving that off the paved roads and stuff. Uh, there wasn't any attention done to uh, gravel roads or anything, but thankfully that event took place and, and uh, the moisture went places off of the road surfaces in a very short period of time and, and things were back to normal for us, so that was good. Gravel foreman returned um, for the season, April 4th. I've uh, been traveling the roads, inspecting for aggregate presence and stuff from where we left off last fall to see if there's anything else that needs to be identified for the program this year. Uh, so he's working his way into things and been carrying out meetings with staff on how they're gonna go about uh, the gravel resurfacing program for the year. So they look like they're on track with all of that. They've also been uh, taking a, a peek at uh, community facilities like the halls, the rinks, fire halls, water distribution centers, sewage lift stations and stuff where uh, operations have to access as well as the public to see if there are any needs in, in some of those areas. I would encourage kind of the egg societies and stuff if they have needs in their community halls and stuff that they communicate that through council member and we get those things thrown into budget as we should be, right? So, um, greater operators, they're actually in their second round of performing uh, regular road maintenance, uh, summer maintenance stuff, uh, working to resolve those deteriorated road surfaces and stuff as we can. Um, what else we got going on there? They've, they've really been running around trying to flag all the locations and stuff for motorists and, and keep everybody apprised as to, to road conditions uh, ahead. So that's what they've been up to. Maintenance operators continue working with the operations form on a variety of assignments. Uh, 57 work orders over the last month. Um, brushing, sign maintenance work orders. Usually the, the big one is sign maintenance. And then uh, we've had a couple of uh, refuse found in road ditches, so garbage that we've had to go in and clean up. And I see somebody's deposited some uh, concrete paving stones and stuff in the ditch and some other debris that we're gonna have to run out and pick up here too that just got filed today. So um, about the time that uh, some customer service requests from the ratepayers were being received is about the same time we sent out the street sweepers to sweep the streets. So. Generally, when the rate pairs start thinking about it, we are too. It's just a matter of getting the contractor in to do that work. So that was done uh, on April 16th through 19th, and I think everything looks pretty good in that regard. Dust abatement application for uh, residential applicants at the subsidized rates closed at the end of April, and uh, we had 291 applications at that time uh, for the deadline. And um, I'm sure there'll be a few more questions from rate pairs and stuff that missed the deadline and whatnot, but... Uh, that's where we sit with that. So compiling that information, getting it into a GIS system so that we 
send staff out to the field with those nice little electronic devices in their hands. They can plunk the stakes in the ground as to where the ratepayer applied for it to be done. And in, uh, in that June, July period, we can get off to the dust abatement program and get that wrapped up. So that's looking good. Uh, seasonal laborers returned on May 2nd. So as per uh, previous report, our four seasonals returned this year. That's the third season in a row. So we're off to the races and out of the gates as soon as they uh, get here. So that's really, really nice for the department to be able to, to uh, have that. So, And uh, Terry is uh, signed up for the Professional Certificate in Asset Management Planning. Um, Manager of Finance, myself, uh, Director of Ag Services have already taken that course. Um, Manager of Operations being Terry and then uh, Director of IT Services, Roberta Fresnel, are also assigned to that right now. So there'll be five of us in this organization that have taken advantage of the FCM um, subsidized rate for asset management planning. So that'll be good for us to have all of that and that experience and be able to collaborate and make, pull those plans together for us and be further ahead. So. Uh, not, no, no change whatsoever in the rural water uh, activations or anything. The numbers stay the same. Uh, I do unfortunately have to report that we have found a major water leak in the system that has been going on for an undetermined period of time, most definitely uh, since November of last year, but believing that it stems before that, we just don't have the data to tie it down yet. And uh, what was happening, um, which led this to go undetected for a period was the uh, rate payer was actually had a pump set up in their dugout and they were pumping water to our roadside ditch when we first caught on to an issue. And uh, they were told that they couldn't do that and they started pumping the water in a different direction and um, about the February period we found that a landowner adjacent to that had been out with his tractor and plowed a trench through his field over to the county ditch and continued to plow the trench down the county ditch to get water out of his field because of the impact. And so then a um, little more investigation revealed that when they put their cistern in, they also uh, had to put uh, washed rock around their, their cistern so it didn't float up if there was groundwater table issues and stuff. And they had a sump installed in that. And that sump was running probably the better part of, of the hour and uh, they were pumping water from that location to the dugout and from the dugout to the roadside ditch and never bothered to say anything. They have a water leak on their side of the curb stop in their yard and it's, um, it's been excessive. So how we track those things, the reporting and stuff is something that we have to get cleaned up in this office so we can monitor better because of course, People on those systems, whether you have one unit, two units, to determines how much water you're delivered per day with the flow restrictors. Um, but we don't have individual meters on each and every user out there to know what's going, but we do have a meter off the lateral for however many users. So we have to be able to divide the maximum uh, quantity per day back by the users against what the meter is saying to see whether we're exceeding that maxim maximum. We should also have numbers to know what the average consumption is per month might fluctuate, some people go south, don't necessarily turn off water, but they're not consuming water. Um, to be able to get something graphed out there that gives us some red flags and stuff when things are starting to go a little bit haywire, right? So got some improvement that we need to do in that to get that captured and whatnot and, and get control of that. But uh, until then, that uh, repair service has been turned off until the repair is complete. And then we will be monitoring closely to make sure that it's holding, so. Uh, we do have uh, the unfortunate circumstance that the road has also been impacted in that area to a significant degree that we're going to have to figure out how we deal with that. So just for council's information, one of those things we learn from and we improve upon and do better in the future. So Highway 73-535, uh, Manager of Engineering carried out an inspection with the engineers in uh, April and uh, they are dealing with some deficiencies and stuff on that on those surfaces right now, but other than that, they're milling in the rumble strips leading up to the paved intersections. They are dealing with the uh, side slope se seating and stuff like that, so we can get some vegetation caught here before spring uh, rains show up, if they show up. Hope they do, it's pretty dry out there, so. Um, the Water Act was approved, uh, Water Act approval was received as well, so the side sloping around Highway 535 at the wetland and stuff will also be taking place with the armoring of that and the uh, high tension cable barrier installation and that should wrap up Highway 535 and, and 873. So things are looking good with camping season 
right upon us to get people to Rolling Hills Res and stuff, so I, I think people will enjoy that much, much more. And I think it'll create some challenges down at Rolling Hills, Hills Reservoir for the EID that I think they're already giving some thought to. So, um, Highway 876 uh, saw Alta Link out on site relocating or working to relocate their one piece of infrastructure that needs to be moved as part of that project. And then Fortis, Alberta looking to mobilize onto that project site as soon as we can get them there to get those 500 poles uh, starting to get moved so that the some grade work can begin as soon as possible as well. So. Things are looking good on that partnership. Uh, North Headgates Water App Act application was submitted uh, May 3rd. Um, and uh, just manager of engineering has also been working to streamline uh, procurement processes and procedures uh, in line with the policy and stuff for the various departments because everybody's kind of been doing something a little bit different, but if we can get that standardized and simplified for uh, the rest of the administration team, we can be able to push those things out a little bit quicker and stuff into the same standard. So things look good there. Annual crack sealing program kicked off on paved roads here uh, May 1st. And uh, following along with that, once that's done, then line paint will come in afterwards so that we're not crack sealing over top of brand new paint. We're painting over brand new crack sealant. So that'll work good. And municipal enforcement is pretty much business as usual with that sort of uh, area. And um, yeah, I've, I've been spending a lot of time trying to get into reports, identify reports that we need to uh, have for management purposes to better be in tune and, and in the know of how things are going and, and if anything's going a little bit sideways to, to manage that stuff. And we're also anticipating that with IT services, we will have uh, tablets prepared and ready to deploy to our field staff so that they can do their own uh, daily time entry because uh, working from a nice little iPhone isn't convenient and the system really doesn't work that well for iPhone use or iPad use, um, but also to get them mobilized and using uh, laser fiche forms, so getting away from paper records and carbon copy records and stuff like that, that when we bring them in the office, we have to spend that duplicate time scanning all of it and putting it into files. They can just do it on their tablet and uh, it goes automatically and we all have records and we can all have access to look it up and and all that great stuff. So they're excited, they're asking for it. We just can't get it to them quick enough, but uh, it's all a process and it takes time. So that's what I've got for you. Questions? Yeah, I've got a couple here. Uh, on those meters, do they uh, automatically send the information in here or do you have to go out and read them? NRSC actually sends us an invoice off of those meters one time per month, so only one time every 30 days do we get to see the uh, consumption going through those meters. But that would give you some idea what's, if there's That's, some leaks. I've mapped out the last two and a quarter years to see the trend on that in a long line and seeing mm -hmm. it increase beyond the maximum number of users that would receive water daily. So. Um, it's just, it's, it's not visible there right now, the way that we're doing things. So we need to improve upon that. Another in, how long on that Water Act application, how long do you anticipate? Six, uh, eight months or? Eight, eight to eight to 12, eight to 15. But we've, the, the one that we had submitted earlier came back in, in about six months, Jeff said. So, um, that one was one of the very first ones in the queue with uh, Alberta environment and stuff. And it was a very simple. Water Act application, so it went through rather well. Um, not sure how the North Headgates thing is going to go, if that's a little bit more detailed and, and uh, inclusive, so we'll see how long that one takes. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, in regards to the rural water hookups, we talked a while ago about maybe going out to do kind of an inventory to see why the inactives were inactive. Wondered if we'd had any progress on that. Um, you kind of just hear a little buzz out there about people that are hooking up, but they're not. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if we've started on that. Um, that was my first question. So that, that one I had a discussion with a, a few of us staff and um, I, I think what we're gonna find is we're gonna find every user has a different reason. I think we're gonna find that People don't have an interest of tying onto the system right now. Their, their water well produces just fine and they have no concerns and they don't want to go through the expense at the time. Uh, you're probably going to find some people don't have the money right now to do it, but they weren't going to skip out on the program because that was their first and foremost uh, benefit. Um, some, some places are service based on speculation. There isn't even a house there. So until a house gets built, they're, they're never going to be active. 
I, I'm, I guess I would ask question, the question back to council, is there really an interest in us spending time polling 411 registered users why they haven't connected to the system? I thought that the, the second part of, and I'm anticipating what your second question is, but tied to that, I think the interest was more finding where the users were not registered on the system to see if there were pockets that we could identify for, for tendering purposes in the future, and, and that's something that's uh, in the works yet, we just haven't produced. But I don't know if that's your second question or not. Yeah, there is that side of it too. Um, also, I guess, is there a concern that people have in fact actually hooked up when they're not registered? <laughs> Good question. Um, if they have, there's a bylaw that allows us to get into those things and, and that's where some of the reporting on what the use is coming off of the laterals and, and servicing locations are for, for water use that we really need to get into and understand. Um, I don't want to go into too much about that because I can definitely put some ideas out there for people that I don't want to um, because some of it can be quite a challenge even in an urban setting it's quite a challenge sometimes to determine who's done what where uh, that nobody knows about so so I I, I don't know I, if if council wants us to pull 411 411 411 users, 401 inactive locations, is that something that council wants us to do? Because we can, that's easy to flag out of the system. They're, they're, still, getting, they're still receiving a base charge. There's, there's, there's an idle service fee right now because they're, they're not on the system. Um, is, is there a concern that we are not selling water to them at 300 gallons a day for the month? No, and I agree. We are going to get those same sort of answers that you just mentioned. So, you know, I was just kind of curious if we had pursued it or had done anything on the other side of it was, you know, is there an interest for other individuals? We have had people that have talked to us about getting on the system and, and that it being fairly expensive and when we run another program and that sort of thing. So yeah. that's the other side of it too that, that I wanted that just to mention. That one's in the works of tying their utility accounts, their residents to the parcel to say, these are the residences that don't have. Um, and my other question just was in re regards to the calcium. Um, what are the numbers like compared to 2018? Good question. I do believe that in in uh, 2018, I think we were uh, about 320 applications, so we're slightly down. Um, but at the same time, that was, uh, that was all applications, I think, because we don't have too many industrial applications, but we did, as council knows, reduce the number of locations that we were doing on the county's behalf. Um, and I, I think some of those went up, but I didn't have that when I wrote this. So I can, I can report on that to you through an email back to council. My question mark is, uh, do, oh, question mark. Um, do we have a policy on checking the water use, checking the water lines um, on a regular basis for leaks? For leaks, well, this is the whole thing of, of getting the reports to be able to tell us what the maximum consumption is if everybody was using 300 gallons a day establishing what the average consumption off of that lateral is for that area and then understanding how it's fluctuating and if it ever exceeds the average, is it to an extent that we need to flag it? Well, is that's, it consistent? that's one way, we, but we there's don't, also other ways of We checking. don't have a policy per se um, because that would mean that we would be going into people's shops or their reservoirs. Some of the people have them underground and quite a ways underground to inspect what their flow emitter looks like. Um, have they tampered with that in any way and then enforcing the bylaw after that if there is. I think we need to understand the data in there first and then start flagging the issues to be able to target areas out of that. Random inspections We'd, we'd start, we, I think we'd have to start picking on everybody just about to go back through that um, rather than... 
Yeah. I know other utility companies that do, um, you know, they pick a, an area annually right. and do uh, flow emitter or flow checks. Right. Yeah, and, no, it's... And that can be done just by driving down the road. Yep. Mm -hmm. we, but, but we don't have meters on everybody, right? But so the... it's not a meter check. It's... Um, uh, somehow they can drive down the road and indicate that there's um, a leakage in the line. I'll learn more about it and we'll talk. Okay. okay. A couple of things. Um, I, I agree with uh, Tracy that it's uh, maybe the, the first job would be where the pockets are of people that have no hookup at all. Right. And yeah, don't go phone 400 people because they all have different opinions. So that one thing. The other one, the 873, since it's paved, I've heard of several people that are now going out camping because they feel comfortable with their bigger, expensive units to drive that road. So that was good. Um, the 876, with the government change, people were concerned that now it was, you know, we're, we're not going to get that 876 paved. So it's good to read that we're still on target. It's all tendered, it's all there, yeah. and work's progressing, so. Mm. Yeah, and then, but the question I had for you was about that crack ceiling. This morning I came in on the one tree road and there were crack ceiling right there, and it's just black with lines. So I thought, gee, how long does it take for the crack ceiling before you get to the point where you say we need a new overlay? So what, what we're, what we're doing in-house right now is, is monitoring what the surface of the road actually looks like. Um, the cracks are there, but there's no significant surface deformation or anything like that. It, it's not rutted out in the wheel paths. It's not um, raveling, so it's humpy and bumpy for you to drive on. We don't have um, block cracking. Uh, we see, we've, we're seeing a bunch of block cracking in the hamlet of Rolling Hills, so it literally looks like blocks or alligator scales, uh, stuff like that. We don't really have that. We have a lot of cracks. And um, as long as we continue to get those sealed up and we don't let that water get into that base, uh, we're, we're good. Um, we've been looking at the age of that infrastructure and at some point it will trigger us to move to an engineer's study to do some falling weight deflectometer testing where they drop heavy weights at various locations to see how it's deflecting and how that structure is holding up to really schedule a preventative uh, maintenance with an overlay or something like that or if, if something major needs to be done. But that road hasn't moved. Like it, it's remarkable how well that road sits and uh, meetings with Alberta transportation staff that, that manage the 544s and, and the three digits and stuff around this Highway 1 and stuff. Um, they've told us, they said, we see what you guys do with crack sealing every year, and that is 100% what they attribute to us having good infrastructure compared to what we see sometimes on their roads, um, because those are the things that often get pulled from their budgets when they're trying to do savings at the provincial level. Um, so kind of reassuring to hear it from, from people that are managing the provincial roads back to us as to how we're doing our stuff and, and that we're doing better, so. I was just going to comment a little further on the water side of things. So I talked to Mark briefly um, about, uh, just shut your mic off Mark, thanks. Um, uh, briefly about what we're going to do and then management team yesterday. So we're going to assign um, meter numbers to the real water users to know which meter they come off of in order to determine the data um, with the bill from NRSE to who's there. We're going to put in service areas, um, shape files to be able to determine where non um, hooked up locations are within a service area. We're going to calculate what a service area has capacity for in terms of future growth because the system is limited. Um, so those are the data. Uh, points that we're going to be looking at doing. It's not going to happen overnight because there's a number of users, but uh, we will get some pretty decent information over the summer for sure uh, for council and especially to be considered at budget time uh, when we're ready. So hopefully that will work for you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, 
Ellen. Yes, I just wonder if the department got any pushback from the people that were taken off the dust abatement uh, list. I didn't actually have anything come back to me. I think there were a few comments of, of disappointment that they got pulled off, but that was consistent with last year when, when people got the letters and found out that they needed to apply on their own. So people still came in and applied for it. I, I, think, I think what's gonna happen is we're gonna find next year is when um, last year's applicants are going to maybe have comments because lots of them apply and carry it through over two years and then apply again and have it reapplied. So I think it might be the following year that we hear from this, this round of people uh, being reduced off the program. So. Just wondering on, on the water supply, those people who have not hooked up, does NRSC has all those they know where the dormant ones are. And I would think that we have the right to go to check those. Th those curb stops should be off. And, and we right. have the right to access the curb stops anytime we want. Um, because that is county infrastructure. That is not the ratepayers infrastructure. Everything after the curb stop, same as in the urban settings, is, is the ratepayers responsibility and, and their ownership. Because the flow emitter is there, that is another piece of our infrastructure which controls how much water is delivered to them. We do have the right to go in and inspect that stuff as well. What they've done with their pipe in between is potentially the question that, that exists that until we have the reports and we can see the maximums and the averages and start to derive some numbers and stuff. When, when we were talking, like. Maybe people in the south consume more water than people in the north, just naturally. Don't know. They might have a higher average than, than people in the south average, or maybe it's the reverse. Um, but we'll be able to have an average of all users and their average monthly consumption, and then we'll be able to get down into those service areas and see what those averages are as well, and see what the maximums are from the capacity on that line and see if anything's exceeding it. And those, those will be the triggers for, for things, right? So our problem is not that curb stops are opened illegally, but after that. Potentially. Hubie? I just wanted to compliment you, Mark, and your staff on that little killifer that they did all the back alleys in Tilly, and they're looking real good. Thank you. Thanks, Phoebe. That. That's always nice to know. And uh, again, I think I've commented before that people have said to me they notice that we do the crack ceiling and are impressed because it's preventive maintenance. So that's uh, good. Clarence. Just one more question. On the, I guess it's on the 876 where 500 poles have to be moved. Is that, what, what is the reason for that? Have we increased the width or? Because the road is coming up, it gets wider at the base, and we've had to do land acquisition to get it to the uh, road allowance width the transportation wants to be able to get the width of the paved surface that uh, is desired, and uh, it's all got to move. And thankfully, they were given their notice in time, and it's the utility company's expense. It doesn't come back on, on us and transportation to pay those costs. I know it's a big cost. So it's really not our concern that Fortis charges it back to all users. Sure. Um, the, the other challenge in that one for, for council's information, and I know I've shared this before, but they have poles down both sides of the road. So it wasn't that we could go to one side and, and construct with little impact, because that would have been considered in the plan if, if it was possible, but there's literally poles down both sides of the road. And a lot of that can be, it, it's not attributed to agricultural land, it, it's attributed to all the uh, oil and gas sector and infrastructure out there running, running the wells and, and servicing the wells and stuff, so. Which is a wonderful thing. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's also the Altalink poles down there too that uh, are carrying high, high load transmission to the north, so. 
Other questions for Mark? And I think it's scotch that's drinking, been being consumed more in the south than in the north, personally. Not water. We just, we, you guys water it down, we just use ice. <laughs> Oh, I knew, I thought I might get a reaction. That was quick. <laughs> um, Mark, you are back, or we're, we're going to have a discussion on annual road tours. I think we'll postpone that because it could be a lively discussion, I think, with lots of different ideas around the table. Um, our 1130 delegation, Mr. Schantz, is here, and so we'll uh, let you head off and see you later when beckoned back. Thank you. We will have a motion to accept the reports of those two gentlemen that were just with us. Anne-Marie moves. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Uh, Brian, please join us at the front table there and we will Move to item 8.1, Provincial Rural Crime Strategy. Brian, have you been here and met everybody in recent history? Um, the button talk. Right there. Okay, now we figured it out. Um, I, I'm trying to think so. The last time I was here was in private council dealing with the Rettleback matter. That was about a year and a half ago now. So I'm not sure if I've, I, I recognize most people. I'm just not sure if everybody's exactly the same as the last time I was here. So aside from aging <laughs> or getting better, who knows? <laughs> um, we're the same. We're the that's, same. That's what I thought. I'm like, I think I recognize everybody, so I wasn't 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure. So, we'll yes. We'll just mention that we do have a new person in our um, council chamber, so that's Carter, the young, good looking fellow over there who is going to be working for the Brooks Bulletin for the summer. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, it is sort of that's cool. That's always nice to hear. Yeah, student. All right. Um, Brian, I'm assuming that you asked to make a presentation. I did. So, yeah, and yeah, I, so I did. Take I, it away. Thank you so much. And I appreciate very much for uh, your time today. As I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, back in January, I took on a new position with the uh, Medicine Hat Crown Prosecutor's Office. Uh, what the, um, the reason that job came available and I was able to uh, take that opportunity is as a result of, as I no doubt most of you are aware, as a result of some high, uh, high, High visible, highly visible crime throughout the province in the rural jurisdictions. The province, uh, the provincial government, responded by uh, implementing further resources into crime prevention and um, and uh, dealing with that sort of thing into the more rural jurisdictions. Medicine Hat. The primary thing was they got an additional crown prosecutor for the first time in in as far as I can remember, being here about ten years now. This is the first addition they've put on. They've had some people go through, but this is first addition. So what um, Ms. Robbins, uh, Ramona Robbins, our, our uh, Chief Crown, has decided to do with that additional manpower is um, to focus on the rural jurisdictions in the area. So that is primarily, obviously, Redcliffe, RCMP, uh, Bow Island, Brooks, and Bazano. Obviously, Brooks and, Brooks and Bazano together have uh, a very large portion of that. Brooks is, of course, the um, only rural um, courthouse in the area, so it's the only circuit court that uh, Medicine Hat deals with, so it is a fairly big area of focus. So what, um, what we've done with that is, we've, uh, is a couple of different things. One, um, there, is a, there are, for the, um, for the Bizano detachment, there is a specific Crown, uh, crown Prosecutor attached to, uh, to that detachment now. That's myself. I drew the straws. I literally live closest to the uh, to Bizano out of everybody else. So I, what I do with that is at least once every six weeks I go out to Bizano. I meet with the detachment, see what their, what their issues are, see if there's any education I can provide, any support I can provide, and basically so that they have somebody there who they know, who they know is paying attention to what's going on, pay attention, providing the support they need, and basically providing more information, more advice, and more education so that there's a smoother transition from what the frontline RCMP do and what our role as uh, Crown Prosecutors are in, uh, in prosecuting the uh, criminal offenses that are charged. So we, so the first step is always that. Um, the city of Brooks and the county obviously um, is covered by primarily the Brooks detachment. They've uh, 
they've assigned two crown prosecutors there. So at least two out of every six weeks, there's um, specific information provided. Again, that kind of support. Obviously, we deal with the Brooks Court, uh, the uh, Brooks Circuit substantially. I'm here generally half the month if uh, I'm not in a conflict issue, but uh, there are there's always a large focus on what's going on there. In addition to that, what we've done is there's a, um, a duty crown uh, set out every week that's focus is not on court, not on anything particular, but again, providing the support for any of the officers who need it so that any advice with more significant offenses, things where we're dealing with sexual assault, where we're dealing with uh, viol a significant amount of violence, uh, dealing with domestic, domestic violence, which is always a major concern, and some of the more major crimes that do come along. There is always somebody there to always answer the phone. Crowns, they're always there to provide that kind of information. Effectively, the idea is to ensure a continued support so that the things that we're hearing about in the newspaper running out of time with uh, with prosecution on major crimes, things getting dropped because there isn't manpower, there isn't sufficient uh, isn't sufficient prosecutors available, there isn't court space, court time for that. Those are just not happening in this jurisdiction as a result. So effectively, we're making sure that not, nothing is left out there, nothing is missed. We're not, we're not, nothing is not being paid attention to, so we're always ensuring that every single thing that comes across our desk, every single um, charge, everything is given the focus it requires so that you're not hearing those things that sometimes come out of Okotoks, sometimes come out of Airdrie, uh, the major one, the major smaller jurisdictions outside of Calgary, where they're just feeling that big things are being missed, big things aren't being paid attention to, or because of the um, Supreme Court's recent decision, which is that they've put strict timelines on everything that uh, comes across the desk from the point of charging. If it's a major offense that has to go to the Court of the Queen's Bench, which is the higher of the two uh, trial courts in uh, in Alberta, Alberta, you have 30 months from charging to, to completion, otherwise it can be thrown out by the courts as an automatic, and if it deals with strictly the provincial court, it's 18 months. So the idea is that for the longest time, Alberta had an issue with uh, lack, of just, lack of judges, lack of justices, lack of crown prosecutors. The idea behind this rural crime strategy is to ensure that just because we are sometimes considered a smaller area, some people see that as less important. Of course, that's not the way we look at it, but there's always that focus, so there's always that importance. So you're not going to see things disappear just because it's gotten to that 18-month period. It's gotten to that 30-month period, so that there is always that focus, and it's always continuous, and, there's no, and we've reduced the gaps in it to make sure that there's more manpower in our area so that there is always that, wonderful, that focus on crime in this area, which fortunately is is some of the lowest I've seen in, in years here anyways, but it always does ensure that uh, nothing is being missed. So that's primarily the reason I, I came today is just to provide that information, uh, answer any questions you might have on it because I know it's not something that the, the council has never seen before is, is, is from this side, uh, Crown Prosecutor coming, providing that information. I know you do get the RCMP reports, whatnot. You hear some things, but part of it was to provide um, you guys any opportunity you wish to ask any questions to learn more about it that's kind of in a nutshell what i'm doing obviously you know a large part of that still is being in court um prosecuting the offenses and trial days and dealing with that and that's my uh, aside from the uh, assignment to Bizano, that's still my primary role is to uh, is to is in trial court to deal with those things on a day-to-day -day basis so thank you questions from people wayne uh, now you were talking what thirty months or th uh, th so three so what years it, or whatever. So what it is is specifically um, what it said is is uh, the court the Supreme Court of Canada came down on what's called the Jordan decision. Mm -hmm. Is that um, the from the date of charging there has if, unless there are compelling reasons otherwise the court has or the. Crown, the court, everybody has 30 months to complete a file from beginning to end if it goes to the higher level of court, so if it deals with Court of Queen's Bench, which deals primarily with um, major offenses and what are referred to as indictable offenses such as murder, um, manslaughter, high, basically high violence crimes, more complex crimes, things like that. You have, about th you have 30 months to deal with it. If it's in the uh, provincial court level, which is simpler stuff, all the way down to theft, fraud, um, domestic violence, um, simple assault, anything like that, you have 18 months. 
So the idea is we need to always be on the ball and making sure that we're moving things forward. That's where a large part of this is to ensure that the police have the proper resources to not delay on charging and not delay on process with that. But also, do you have enough judges? Because I heard that that was, a, especially with the feds, that's, that is becoming right. an issue. So how it works, so I'll, I'll just explain how, how that works. Is So on the provincial court, uh, provincial court of Alberta, the judges are appointed by the province. So the province covers the budget, the province pays for those. Um, so those, as I understand it, they filled that up uh, prior to the last election. So there have been a substantially large number of new judges appointed. Um, Medicine had received a new judge for the first time in a while. So we're actually, we're at our full complement right now. Um, Medicine Hat, Lethbridge, Brooks, um, are covered by the same um, by the south jurisdiction of uh, of the pro of the provincial courts, so we are operating at uh, my understanding is our, our high full capacity right now. Dealing with the Court of Queen's Bench, those are appointed by the federal government. They're paid for by the federal government, um, and effectively, it's up to the government to the federal government to decide to appoint. Now, my understanding is. Um, from what I've read, and this is just from what I've read, is that we are still low on that. However, in the Medicine Hat, Lethbridge uh, area, we are again sitting at our full capacity for uh, Court of Queen's Bench judges. And I will say this, the, the clerks and the, court and the justices in the area are exceptional. So it's, we don't suffer the, uh, the same level of uh, delay that Calgary and Edmonton sometimes do. So, Brian, you mentioned um, education. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if reactionary education is in order. Um, we recently, word on the street is that um, a young man was protecting his property and um, rolled his truck um, out in the Hazar area. So I'm wondering if some education for rural property owners might be in order? So that's something I could certainly take a look at and see if, see what kind of options we have for providing public education. Like for example, what I've, what I've been primarily focused on uh, as of late is um, with the Bizano detachment is because they've changed the uh, impair, all the impaired driving driving laws. We've gone to mandatory, uh, mandatory requirements where we can get a, a they can, we can ask somebody to blow without, uh, without a reason or cause, unlike it was before. So we're, we're currently trying to educate, um, for example, I'm tr currently trying to educate the younger officers in the detachment the best way to approach dealing with that. But that is so, so, so something that, um, I, frankly, until you brought it up, I hadn't thought of providing that kind of public education because, I mean, it does come down to the same thing, the proper responses in a situation like that where you see that happening is to try to uh, remove yourself from any, any risk or harm and Call the call the RCMP now. I realize Hazar is an isolated location where that's not always the first instinct, and and that's part of you know part of why we're trying to, to provide this information. So that is certainly something I am uh, meeting up with um, um, Co uh, Corporal Anderson here um, in June, and that's something certainly I can approach with him. So that's definitely a wonderful idea. So that's something I can definitely look into. Yeah. Other questions? Brian. Um, you mentioned the, the time limit on some of those, uh, the 18 months and the 30 month. What is, what is the average, what you guys are dealing with in this area as far as, as completing a, uh, a case, so to speak? So this is speaking strictly from my personal, um, personal uh, experience in, in dealing with the last, uh, last bunch of years down here and, and of course the last, because I've only been with the Crown coming out five months now, but what I can say is if we're dealing with stuff that's specifically dealt with in Brooks, which is at the provincial level, um, the maximum we would normally see something um, sitting around for is about 12 months. And usually that's because it is a little more complicated or there's been some delay in getting certain types of reports from uh, outside bodies or we're dealing with uh, um, an offense of a specific nature that's a little more complicated, things like that. So. I would say it's very rare we see something go beyond 12 months. Um, if it goes up to the Court of Queen's bench, the longest I've had anything sitting around up there is two years, and that was because, again, of some un unusual delay um, that was unexpected. So generally, 
you can see everything. Most things in the in the court of Queen's bench are usually done within about eighteen months. Whereas the provincial court, I'd be very surprised if something sets around in this area longer than a year, unless there's something where we're dealing with things we can't control. And when I say that, it's dealing with witnesses who aren't available because of illness or something like that, or um, scheduling issues with uh, Crown, or unfortunately, sometimes the defendants just don't appear. So if any delay is unexpected and beyond our control, those don't generally count within the 18 months I'm speaking to, as long as the Crown and the police are able to get it to um, trial within eight to 12 months, which isn't a difficulty. Any, any um, delays caused by the defendant or anything outside of that control don't count towards that, that time period. No. So you mentioned judges. So is that a prestigious position to achieve or is that a burden? I, I would say this, given what, um, in my personal, um, my personal experience in dealing with it, I, I would consider it a prestigious, a very prestigious role. And the reason from, for that is, um, while it is a, as well a burden because you are, of course, in dealing with uh, being the judge, you're the, um, you know, you're the, the final position, you're the person making the decisions and conflicts that can't be uh, resolved in any other way. And that's the thing, even with um, criminal files, things like that, there are ways to resolve files by agreement and um, joint submission, whatnot. So, I mean, the being a judge is, in my view, it's a tremendous burden, but at the same time, it is a um, very honorable position. It's a position of great prestige because effectively you, you are in this country, in Alberta specifically, you're not elected, you're appointed. So it's a, it's a role that you specifically agree to take on. It's something where you put in your effort and you become, you know, you're, it's a one where you have to be constantly educated. You have to be constantly aware of the change in the law. You have to take into consideration so many different uh, aspects of, uh, of a sentence, dealing with the circumstances of the, of the accused, dealing with the circumstances of the victim, what the law is con saying right now as to the, uh, uh, the severity of the offense versus what is made, said 10 years ago, two years ago, um, having to balance societal, um, societal desires versus what the law says. So it's a constantly changing, um, constantly changing role and but at the same time it is something that um i mean most members of the law society you know if they're interested and they they put their whole career towards achieving that um achieving that role other questions kevin madam reeve so ryan thanks for what you're doing we appreciate making sure criminals are held to account um, just wondering if Orville had to come out of retirement after you left locally. Uh, Dad's working back in the office full time, so he went. He decided to to go back full time after I I, I chose the role, and he was he's extremely supportive of uh, the decision I made. But at the same time, that's what his choice was to go back full time. So I think he's still enjoying himself. I saw him today, and he 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 was in a pretty good mood. So, yeah. <laughs> But what about your mother? Don't answer that question. <laughs> well, Mom's in a very good mood these days too. So, but she also has four grandkids around here too. So, um, from your perspective, Brian, you, th you feel as though this is making quite a difference. I think so. Even even in the initial, like I said, we've just started this with uh, me coming on on board in the last few months. But even with the in, the initial feedback I've gotten, uh, specifically from uh, Corporal Anderson, who's the uh, new CO up out in Bizano, he's from uh, he did his entire uh, career to this point up in K Division, which is the territories, and he's finding it a very a very positive experience. We've uh, had some uh, definite positive feedback from the Brooks RCMP as well because we're able to focus a little, for, focus more on the issues they have. Have, have a more immediate response, um, allow us to deal with education and whatnot, especially, and responding to some of the issues that come up because we are such a unique community. The number, the diverse, um, the diverse, um, what are my words? Exactly, the diverse language skills, the diver, uh, just the diverse number of people in this area that is just so unique to us. We're having to deal with so many different things, sometimes on a very quick uh, basis. So the, they're finding the immediate response more appreciative of the fact that we're able to uh, provide that uh, more extensive information um, on a quicker basis. So, I mean, the last time I was doing the duty crown, we were answering some questions dealing with uh, um, 
domestic violence in the, with the new Canadians, and we were able to provide a compelling, a lot of compelling information very quickly, and have a discussion between um, our office, the Bizano office, and Brooks at the same time, so that we're we're working on a very um, on the same page, whereas as opposed to dealing with things in a different place or different ways, even though we're very close to each other. So, it's it seems to me that uh, there's a, definitely a positive uh, a positive result coming out of this. That's good, and and this was uh, put together as a uh, ongoing program. It wasn't just short term. It's it's intended. To, so how it is is intended. The theory behind it is is to be ongoing, long term. Um, we're we're operating this through to June, and then we do a start again in the fall. There's some just some uh, we're the the crown uh, the duty crown isn't available in the summer just because of vacation. We're we're, we're generally a bit more short. However, there's always people there, and uh, the courts slow down in the summer, so I don't expect there's going to be any difficulty with uh, just a bit for the summer. So, but the plan is we do have it scheduled uh, to proceed throughout the year, and then based on the feedback um, from the various uh, various. Um, RCMP detachments that's going to be adjusted to see to ensure that it's do, uh, done correctly to best fit their needs and uh, through the crown feedback. But as of right now, it's 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 shown to be something very positive, especially in uh, what I really like about it is in Bizano Brooks, we have always have a youthful detachment that allows us to provide more uh, education quicker to uh, officers who are very much learning, very much trying to figure themselves out, and obviously just don't have the experience that uh, some some detachments do. So it does provide quicker, better support for them, so that they they uh, grow much um, um, to much greater ability faster. Anything else? Well, thanks, Brian, for yep. taking the initiative to come in and, and uh, fill us in on what's going on with that, and it's certainly been a problem for a long time, the, the uh, backlog, so. No, I very much appreciate the uh, opportunity to come and speak to you as always, so uh, very much thank you, thankful for that. And of course, if there's anything that comes up, if the, if the uh, county is worried about anything, our office is always there. You can always contact me. I'm always in the area. Um, so, you know, if it's something of specific need or specific concern that comes up, that's uh, part of the reason I come here is to show to ensure that that can be uh, dealt with us directly if need be. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right. It's a good warm day out there. Yeah. All right. Do you have a card, Brian? I don't. <laughs> what is uh, yeah what a surprise <laughs> perfect thank you all right we will go back to um working doing some stuff with uh lane perhaps 10 to both city community hall society or association requests cemetery matter been a long time since we've had a cemetery matter lane. Yeah. This is yeah. a rather interesting situation. It's it's often the case when something comes up, you start scratching below the surface, and there's always more than meets the eye. You'll recall that the Bow City Community Association had approached us about the possibility of the county taking over the property that the Bow City Community Center is located on. We were had reached agreement to consolidate the titles. When they went back and started investigating other things that are a bit of a burr under their blanket, so to speak, they've um, started looking into some of the challenges that they're having with operating the Bow City Cemetery. It's a completely separate matter from the Bow City Community Hall. The cemetery is located quite a distance north and east of the community center. Separate piece of land, separate issue altogether. But when I received this request, I started to investigate what was really going on and, and what the issue was. There are four types of cemeteries that the government oversees. Municipally owned cemeteries, of which the Patricia Cemetery is one. It's operated by volunteers, but the county is the registered owner of the Patricia Cemetery. You have historical cemeteries that were started by cemetery companies. 
the Rolling Hills Cemetery is one that was started by the Rolling Hills Cemetery Company, and that cemetery company is volunteers that is looking after and maintaining this cemetery in Rolling Hills. A third category are cemeteries that are affiliated with religious organizations. So that would include all of the Hadrat cemeteries. It would include the cemetery in Scandia, which is actually owned by the church in Scandia. The fourth category of cemeteries are commercial cemeteries, and these are cemeteries that, for the most part, are owned by private sector for-profit organizations. Unfortunately, Bow City and the Bow City Cemetery has been lumped into the category of a commercial cemetery, and there is an entirely different set of rules that apply to commercial cemeteries. There are regulations that are in place, and when I started to drill into the regulations, there are only four commercial cemetery operations in the province of Alberta, and Bow City Cemetery is one of those four. Go figure. Now, Chris, when, what you, when was it established, Lee? I think it, uh, when was it, late 90s? It wasn't that long ago. Oh, I yeah. thought maybe. And that's, that's one of the reasons why it was established as a commercial cemetery, because they're no longer accepting applications for cemeteries to be established as cemetery companies. If it's a church cemetery or a municipal cemetery, by all means, have at it. But there was a group of individuals in the Bow City area that wanted to establish the Bow City Cemetery. I'm guessing that the county of the day wasn't interested in taking over ownership or getting involved, and so the only option for them was to, yes, you can establish, but it's going to be a commercial cemetery with these three other commercial operations. And as soon as it's a commercial operation, they're required to meet reporting requirements to make sure that unsuspecting families aren't being taken advantage of by commercial, private sector, for-profit operations. So they're being held to a much higher standard than any of the other cemeteries in the county when it comes to annual reporting requirements. All of the other cemeteries, there are no annual reporting requirements, none whatsoever but the both city cemetery, the community organization that's looking after that has got to submit an annual report regarding the financial state of affairs. There has to be a reserve account set aside in case the um, both city cemetery or in case the both city community association ceases to exist, then that reserve account kicks in to take over the maintenance of the cemetery. Uh, I don't know how strenuous the reporting requirements are, but it's enough to generate this request that is before council. So there is an option if council is prepared to apply to the government to take over ownership of the cemetery. The community association has confirmed that they fully intend to continue operating it as they have in the past where they would look after the openings and the closings, maintaining the site, doing all of the grounds maintenance, whatever is required. So there wouldn't be any direct involvement for the county other than being the owner on record, the same as we are with the Patricia Cemetery. It's not going to be, however, as simple as council saying, sounds like a good idea, let's do this. We would have to start the ball rolling and it would literally require a change in legislation. So it's going to take time for this to happen if council sees fit to do this. So that's the background behind it. It's before you for your consideration. It would only be done to make the load easier for the Bow City Community Association to continue to operate the Bow City Cemetery. That's the background. Questions? Anne-Marie. Um. Maybe you wrote that in your report, but I forgot how um how active is this cemetery? Like, is it a is it a big one? I'm not familiar with it. No. That was one of the pieces of information I've gleaned from them. They say that there's usually two to three burials a year. It, it's not really active in in the truest sense of the word. I'm guessing that Rolling Hills probably experiences quite a few more. 
burials than what rural, uh, what Bull City would. And there's certainly more than the Patricia Cemetery. From what I understand, the Patricia Cemetery probably has had one or two in the last three or four years. Uh, I don't know the history that well. But no, it, it's not that active. When, when I spoke with the fellow that's looking after it, they said they're kind of on watch waiting for someone who is most likely going to become a resident of the cemetery before too much longer. <laughs> Kelly? And what is capacity? What is, what is the space available? Like, what is life expectation of this cemetery? Good question. I haven't looked at that. I, I'm thinking that the parcel is probably two to three acres in size, I can find that information out. And if it's only experiencing two or three a year, has been around for maybe 15, 20 years, uh, I'm guessing there's a, a many years left before there's going to be an overcrowded situation there. The reason I ask is because what we've found, what I've experienced personally, is there are people looking from the city outward at places to rest at a cheaper cost, at a, at a substantially sa cost savings to the family. So we have to be cognizant of that and also um, um, make sure that it's a worthwhile venture. Like, it, I, I think we need to check into costs for burial to make sure that they're competitive or at least being charged even. I think we would have, an, there would be requirements I think that we need to look into. Mm -hmm. Lane and Ellen, Lionel. So if it was operated on the same basis as the Patricia Cemetery operates right now, it's the local volunteers that set the rates. They're the ones that do the openings of the gravesides and the closure after the funeral service is over. And it was my understanding that the community association for both cities planning on carrying on in the same way. They're the ones that set the rates when there's a need for a site to be prepared. They look after it completely. We don't have any direct involvement in Patricia and don't foresee having any direct involvement in this one if, in fact, the decision is made to, to go ahead with this. Ellen? Now, these maintenance and, and operations, um, can we put that into an agreement? Maybe I should ask Brian. Uh, for any guarantees, let's say it gets really busy and people from the city are going to go buy lots there. Um, so, so it's an agreement, but is it just by handshake? No. Uh, no, I, I think in this situation, because we would literally be taking over the title, there would need to be a fairly clear understanding as to what terms and conditions would apply if, in fact, we're going to do this. Um, the rates are set right now by the Bow City Community Association as the owner and operator of the cemetery, and in an agreement to acquire the title, we could just say that the Bow City Community Association is the one that sets the rates, uh, they determine what the policies are for accepting individuals. Uh, th those details, of course, would have to be worked out. And I think it, it, it's clearly not something where we would want to do this with the idea that we would become directly involved in any way, shape, or form in the actual operation of the site. All, all that it's being or would be done for is to lighten the load of volunteers when it comes to the reporting requirements at the provincial level. And it makes no sense for it to be in the same category as the, the cemeteries that you mentioned. I mean, good grief. They're huge. Lionel. I guess my question has basically been answered just now, but about, about maintenance in the future. Um, because other cemeteries, the Duke of Sutherland, for instance, we do maintain it. It's inactive. I don't know that anybody's allowed to be used to use it any longer, but the county does maintain it. Uh, just wondering about you. You say this one would be not not our responsibility. 
this will be their their own responsibility to take care of it? Correct. The one that you're referring to, it, it would have been an old historical cemetery and there is no group involved at all. And I think that our, our maintenance is limited to mowing it a couple of times a year. Uh, beyond that, there's nothing else that's done. Uh, so we wouldn't, that cemetery, you, no one would be able to buy a plot and inter somebody in, in that cemetery right now. As long as the Bosidji Community Association is around, uh, they would have the responsibility if in fact they ever cease to exist as an organization, then what council could simply do is the Bow City Community C Cemetery is now inactive and it would basically fall into the same status as the one that you've referred to. Tracy and Kelly. Um, <clears throat> my question is just a little bit on sort of the transfer of the title and so would it be like a Bow City Community Association would have like a lease with us saying that they would op continue to operate the, uh, the cemetery as in the past, but land title is just transferred to us. Um, and then also, if they do cease to exist, what is the procedure for, like, do you have to go through protocol to deem a cemetery inactive then? Good questions. I, I've made the assumption that changing a cemetery from active to inactive would be as simple as a resolution and you no longer accept um, requests for burials at that location. Let me find out more detail on that specifically. We would have to put together an agreement that spells out quite clearly what the county is accepting in making a decision to go ahead and what the community association is expected to commit to if in fact Council is prepared to approve this request. Those would be some of the details that we would have to bring back to Council. Um, and then would there be like, because there's going to be a change in titleship, right, of the, the type of cemetery? Now is that something that county administration will have to do? Or does that still go through the Bow City Community Association? Because it should go under the municipal owned cemetery category, right? In this case, the Bow City Community S S Association would have to sign off on the land title transfer. The county would have to accept the transfer. And because it's a commercial cemetery subject to provincial regulations, the Minister of Service Alberta would also have to approve the transfer of title. It's not something that, that the county and the Bow City Community Association can decide to proceed with independent of anybody else. The Minister will literally have to sign off on the transfer of title or the, the request to transfer the title. And the point I was trying to make is just to be sure and check into what the requirements are to make sure just because Patricia has operated a certain way over the years, um, just be sure what our responsibilities. I know there's um, recording requirements and death certificate. It, those things have to be recorded and so that has to be dealt with. I'm just asking you to check into what that because it's going to fall back to the landowner, which we would become, yeah. Lane, oh, Brian. Um, <clears throat> so, and you may have touched on it, Lane, and I apologize if I'm asking a question you've already answered, but in the case of like Rolling Hills, what would be the steps if, if Bow City wanted to revert to, the, to that sort of a establishment or is that granted because I know you mentioned that they're, they don't grant new cemeteries unless it's municipal or commercial but so that's I'm curious about that part yeah when I spoke with the individual with service of Alberta yeah applications for cemetery companies or to establish a cemetery company from what I understood they are no longer being accepted the cemetery companies are old historical organizations, 
the legislation acknowledges the fact that they exist, but that's why Bo City, when they established this cemetery, relatively recently, they were forced into that category of a commercial operation as opposed to a cemetery company. Ideally, that would have been the best category to place them into, is a cemetery company. That option wasn't made available to them. And for whatever reason, there must not have been any interest in allowing it to be established as a municipal cemetery at that time. So Lane, um, oh, Brian. Well, I just think we, we, have, we have to help these people out. I mean, this is onerous upon them. I mean, they're volunteer organizations and to do that kind of reporting just seems, I don't <laughs> want to use the word ridiculous, but I don't think that's, that's fair to them. So I, I hope we move forward. It says the option is to direct administration. I don't know if you need a motion, Madam Reeve, but uh, I'd like to see us help them out and come up with an agreement that's similar to Patricia where, you know, whether it's uh, doing our part and, and the volunteers take care of their part, I hope we don't stand in their way. Thank you. And I think the way the motion is written to direct administration to proceed with the transition, um, proceeding with it should answer any further questions that you come up against, Lane. Because I do notice down below that you do uh, mention unwanted precedent. Um, so I guess along the, the way, if that, there's a concern, it'll come back to us. But it really doesn't make sense to have these guys in the same category as those other three. Just, it's hilarious, actually, how that could happen. All right, motion on the table. Further discussion, all in favor? Opposed, motion is carried. And so that finishes off item 10-2 and we will break for lunch. And what time would you folks like to come back? Hammergren, no. Do, do you? <laughs> Do you want, <laughs> today's a weird day, you guys. How about uh, quarter to one? One, quarter to one, 1245? Got it, everybody?